Find, if you would, in your Bible, Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter 15. Also, if you would, please, find 1 Peter chapter 1. Matthew 15, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we'll, we are continuing our study today in the book of Matthew, and I'm excited about the message today. I'm excited about the passage of Scripture that God has for us. We need this passage of Scripture, and we need it exactly where God has it placed in the book of Matthew. And I want to preach a message today entitled, in keeping with the theme of our of our study as Christ being the promised Messiah, the King of the Jews, um, I, I'm preaching a message entitled, The King's Experiment. The King's Experiment. Did you ever do an experiment when you were a kid? Did you ever blow anything up? Did you ever do physical damage to your house, your skin, yourself, your neighbor? Um, my, my kids are in their science department and science classes. Seems like when you have four kids, you're constantly doing experiments. Um, an experiment is that work which you do to prove a thought or a hypothesis. It's not necessarily something that is designed to prove just an imagination. You have a truth and you're going to use an experiment to expose or to define that truth, whether positive or in the fact that it does work or the fact that it does not work in the negative. So I want you to remember as we go through the Bible passage today that Jesus Christ is, is, is initiating an experiment today. If you do not understand that, you're going to have difficulty in your, in your love for God. The second thing I need you to do is I need you to hang in until the very end of the message. Don't let your mind wander. Um, because if you jump out on me early, you might come to the understanding that Jesus is mean or cruel or he's not good. Sometimes people want to use the passage of scripture that we're going to, to try to um, attack the goodness of God. Let me just be real clear about it. Our God is good. It's good all the time. The number one thing that the enemy will try to do in your life is he will try to attack the goodness of God. It's amazing that he's ferocious at it before we're saved and he's equally ferocious at it after we're saved. I, I, run a, I run into Christian people who through circumstance or difficulty or whatever begin to question the goodness of God. These are the same people that are trusting his goodness in their salvation, but they don't trust his goodness in their daily life. Um, help me with the verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he's good yesterday, he's good today. Despite... My circumstance, my difficulty, my problem. As I look to the future and I see need, question, concern, he's still good. If he's good yesterday, he's good today, and he's good forever. So I need you to hang in there in just a little bit. Um, we come to Matthew chapter 15. Our text is verses 21 to 28. Um, in these verses, uh, Matthew, I believe, is strategically, by the Spirit of God, placed these verses here to be an illustration to the nation of Israel. When I was in Bible college, they used to teach us the importance of illustrations. And they would say that illustrations, when you preach, are much like windows. Now, we don't have windows in this auditorium. But a window is designed to let light into a room. Um, sometimes you buy a house based on how many windows are there, and you like light. So then you want to open up the shades so the light 
comes in. When you're preaching and you're giving expository, you're teaching truth and you're making application, sometimes you need to cut a little hole in the, in the teaching and let a little light in. And you do that through illustration. Jesus has been teaching the nation of Israel. He's been teaching truth. Now he's going to cut a little hole into their life and he's going to let a little light in. Especially is he going to let a little light in on his disciples. Um, Pick up, if you would, in verse 21. After a fierce battle with um, the Pharisees in the previous 20 verses, like we talked about last week, and after the Lord Jesus has... um, pin them to to the ground with the thought of their transgression of the commandment of God. They were worried about the transgression of the elders. You might remember that message from last week. The Bible says in verse number 21, then Jesus did what class? He went. He went thence. Now this is a, this important part of this passage here. This is the first time in the ministry of his earthly ministry, that Jesus will step outside the bounds of Palestine. He'll step outside the boundary of the nation of Israel, and he's going to the coast of Tyre and Zidon. You'll see that in verse number 21. Now, he's doing something here physically that is symbolic of what he has done spiritually. You remember the nation has already pretty much rejected him. We came to that chapter where the Bible says that he went out of that house after they had blasphemed him. When the leadership of the nation said, you are of Beelzebub. And they took that position and Jesus said, say what you want to about the son of man, but you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. The Bible says from that point forward, he made his turn and he went out of the house of Israel. And now he began really and truthfully to make his approach and his offer to the Gentiles. Remember, he came to offer himself to the nation of Israel first, and then then he would present himself to the Gentiles. Now he's doing something physically that has been taking place spiritually and he's gonna step outside of the boundary. Pick up, if you would, in verse number 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Now this woman is a Gentile. This woman is a Syrophoenician woman, we learn from the book of Mark. This woman uh, comes from that accursed nation. She's not in the nation of Israel. She is a Gentile. She came and she cried unto him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. So we've got a woman here who's a mother. And if you're a mother in this room and your child has a problem, you have a problem. If your child has a burden, you have a burden. If your child is vexed, you're vexed. If your children have difficulty, then there's no delight in your world. You're concentrated on the difficulty. This is a woman who is driven. This is a woman who is desperate. This is a woman that would give her life if her child could be relieved from the vexation of this wicked, false spirit, this demon. This woman in that position comes to the Lord Jesus. Do you understand the text? Yes or no? All right, let's go. Verse number 23. And he immediately met her need, fixed her problem, and gave her grace. Does your Bible say that? No, it doesn't. Look at verse 23. But he answered her not a what? word. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of mean. That's kind of difficult. She comes tormented. She comes with a tremendous desperation. She comes begging mercy and he does nothing. He does nothing. He, he, he doesn't even acknowledge her. He doesn't answer her nothing. Keep going. The disciples came and besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. 
Now, this speaks of this woman's relentlessness. This is not just a one-time approach. She's crying, have mercy, son of David. Have mercy, son of David. And it is a persistent and a desperate and cry that just is relentless. And she's pouring out her heart and Jesus is just not answering a word. The disciples are so annoyed and so bothered, not per se by the woman, but just by the relentlessness. Would you do something? Just send her away if you're not going to do anything. Pick up in verse number 24. But he answered, by the way, go back to verse 23, and you should take a pin here, and you should underline those words, but he answered. You're going to find them again in verse 24. You're going to find them again in verse number 26. They, they divide. They outline this passage. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, say those two words. Help me. I mean, this woman is desperate. Have mercy Touch my child, nothing. When he finally responds to hers, I have nothing to do with you. Lord, help me. Powerful cry. Verse 26, here we go again, the third one. But he answered and said, it's not fit. It's not meat. It's not right to take the children's bread and cast it to what, class? Dogs. P pretty strong statement. It's not meat. It's not fit to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now, what you need to remember about this is the Jewish nation referred to the Gentiles as dogs. This word is different than what Jesus used here. It's not the street dog slang term that the average Jew would use toward a Gentile in disgust. This word is a little dog. We would call them puppies. Do you like puppies? Yeah. I got news for you. Puppies grow into mangy pets. Okay. So cute. What happened to our cute dog? He just grew. Be careful on puppies. Give you another thing. This one's from, this, this is free. This don't cost you anything. When you go to the pet store and you want to pick out a pup, puppy, never pick out the puppy that's jumping at the fence and, <laughs> and wagging his tail and real aggressive. If you pick that puppy, they're going to eat your shoes, your couch. They're going to make a mess. You always want the docile puppy. That's the one that you want to pick. All right? So let's understand the text. You have a desperate woman and she wants help. She's got a need. She comes to the Lord, and the Lord just answers her nothing. When he does answer her, it's a separation. I don't have anything to do with you. When she's finally so persistent, he looks at her and says, I, I, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. Now, to the average person, we would be like, you're not talking to me like this. Who do you think you are? I'm done with you. And we would hit the road. Remember, I told you at the beginning, you cannot forget in this passage that God is good. Okay. So what do we have here? We have here a contrast in an illustration. Jesus has been teaching his own nation. And even though this own nation has been, his own nation had been given everything, they believed nothing. And even though they stood behind the, the heritage of, of the seed of Abraham and the lineage of that, and they stood behind the religion of the Pharisees, and they, they presented themselves in some kind of exterior religious position, they, they had not hearts of faith. They had not hearts of, of, of belief in the Lord. And so he has stepped outside of their boundaries and he's run into this woman who's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. This woman who is poor in spirit. This woman who has a heart of faith. Now understand this. 
Prior in the text, Matthew remembers writing to the nation of Israel. And Matthew is now giving the nation that he's writing to an illustration of true faith. Prior to the text already we have that when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these people would reason in their heart against the Lord, we were told that God knew what they were thinking in their heart. If you believe God knows the thoughts of your heart, say amen. Okay. So God knows and Jesus knows what is in this woman's heart. He knows that he's got a woman who is full of faith. He's run into something that does not exist in his own land. And though his heart was bleeding and pleading for his own people, they rejected him. Great faith, which is mentioned here in the next verse, is only mentioned twice in the book of Matthew, and it's mentioned about the centurion back in chapter 8. So Jesus knows he's got a woman full of faith. Well, pastor, if Jesus knows he's got a woman full of faith and she's an honest woman here, why is he so cruel to her? Why would he treat her like this? Ah, now you need to go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is imperative for your understanding. Look, if you would, at verse number 7. Speaking here to a group of people who are suffering beyond measure, Peter helping them understand their suffering, their, their heaviness is mentioned in verse number six. In verse number seven, he says, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be what class? Tried. Tried how? With fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So Peter says, true faith is a faith that is able to stand a testing. And, and tested faith is evidence of true faith. And true faith is that which pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And true faith will be found to be glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Jesus, knowing this woman, has run into a woman who has a heart of faith. It's true faith, therefore it can be tested. By the way, Christian, God will constantly test your faith in your life. And, and so he knows something nobody else knows except this woman. So instead of just moving in a quick response to this woman, he's going to do an experiment. He's going to test it. He's going to lay this woman's faith open so that everybody could look in and he can receive the glory. Who's the everybody? It's an illustration and a window into the nation that has rejected him. They look at this dog and who deserves nothing. And Jesus is about ready to do a powerful work in her life based upon the fact that she trusts him. He's also got disciples. Send her away. She's annoying us. Well, who does she think she is? But he's going to teach them that he has other sheep which are not of this fold. And every Gentile in this room ought to say, amen. amen. It's a powerful illustration. So now you come back and what is happening? Well, the first way that Jesus tests her faith is he tests this trusted faith with silence. Why does he test this faith, this faith with silence? Okay, for that, you need to hold your hand here and you gotta go to 1 Kings chapter five. I won't turn you again, but I beg you to go to 1 Kings chapter five. Pastor, what in the world would 1 Kings have anything to do with the book of Matthew? Wait till you see this, 1 Kings chapter five. What, what coast or what region is our text in? What were the two cities? Tyre and Zidon, right? Okay, come to 1 Kings chapter 5, and look, if you would, at verse number 1. 
Are you there? Okay. My ears are so stuffed up. Don't touch the sound. I can't even hear myself. It feels like when I was sleeping, Beverly shoved cotton into my ears or something today. So if I'm asking you to respond, I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. All right. Uh, Verse number one. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. Now watch this. For Hiram, who's the king of Tyre, was ever a lover of who? David. David. Okay, now you can come back from that passage. Come back to Matthew. Look at me. Where this woman lived in the coast of Tyre, all the way back from the time of David, this, this, these people, even though they had missed out, the cities had missed out on the blessing of God, as Jesus already said, they had already had, they'd always had an affiliation with David. And they loved King David. And so they, they, they had this trust and this bond in, the, in David as, the, as a man and as a king. So this woman, according to Mark chapter 7, had heard, she had heard who Jesus was and what he had done. And by the way, help me with this verse. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the? Okay. So she had heard. And in hearing, faith had developed in her heart. The problem is... That, and not the problem, but what Jesus was testing or proving, that faith wasn't just in her intellect, but it was in her heart. Because her initial approach was an intellectual approach. Her initial approach, if you look at verse number 22, she said, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou, say those words, son of David. Son of David, she did not have the right to come under the umbrella of the son of David. She's a Gentile. She had no authority there. She, 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 the son of David, that was a legal term that was identifying Christ. But that, that position there, that belonged to the house of Israel. She is a Gentile, but she had an intellectual knowledge that Jesus is the the son of David. And so in her initial approach, she's initially approaching with a faith that's kind of proxied. She's initially approaching with a faith that is in her her mind and in her intellect. And so Jesus is now testing this faith. He's proving this faith. He's exposing her real faith. But remember his audience. His audience isn't this woman. His audience is this whole nation and these 12 disciples. And they've been nothing but with people that have said, the son of David, the son of David, we, we, we're, we're trusting in the son of David. And Jesus would uh, declare himself to be the son of David. And they rejected him. And the nation had this intellectual position of faith based on their proxied relationship through Abraham, but they did not have a person through Jesus Christ. And by the way, the only way you have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. Everyone has faith, but an intellectual faith is a faith that is misplaced. You can't just have an intellectual faith based on some legal contract or some knowledge here. And so this woman approaches, she has true faith, but Jesus wants to show them that this is not just an intellectual proxied position. This woman will get nothing because of her intellect. Nothing. And so she's relentless at it. She's relentless at it. Relentless at it. Son of David, son of David, son of David. And Jesus won't even respond to her. He just keeps going. Answering her, not a word. Finally, the disciples, they, 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 they say, she, she doesn't have a right to say, son of David, if you're not, would you just tell the woman something, send her away? Look at his response here. He comes down in verse number 24. He addresses her. He says, but I'm not, I, he answered, said, I'm not sent 
but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, let me tell you something. That's an offensive statement. An offensive statement. And, and, and here's what Jesus is proving. Jesus is proving that this woman is not trusting with just some intellectual faith. By the way, it's in your mind where we get offended. Our world, really and truthfully, that the religious world that wants to kind of find favor with God somehow in an intellectual position, well, I'm a church member. Well, I do good, or I give, or I do these kind of things. And Jesus is coming after that intellectual faith because he knows that that, that part of a person can suffer tremendous offense. And when he looked at the nation of Israel and they stood there in their intellect and he said, yeah, but your heart is wicked. They were offended, man. Don't you dare tell me that. So they didn't have real true faith. And so now he's exposing real true faith and he's saying it's not in your intellect, although you have to have the mind there, but he's moving now to her heart. And look where he moves. He moves to a personal relationship. I'm not sent to you. I'm sent to the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him saying, what class? Lord. No more son of David. No more intellect. Now you have a woman who is desperate. And God knows, Christ knows that position. But he's using this to open up this illustration that she's not approaching on an intellectual basis. She's approaching on a personal. Lord, help me. Deep within her heart does she want the touch of the master. By the way, Lord, help me is a great prayer. You ever prayed, Lord, help me? Say amen. Man. Lord, help me. She has no authority. Help me, God. Help me. Oh, Jesus is getting ready to show them an awesome thing. Her heart is pouring out. She's moved, he's, he's exposed that it's not a proxy faith that's needed. It's a personal faith that's needed. By the way, Nobody in this room gets to heaven because of somebody else's faith. Nobody. If you're sitting there thinking, well, my mom and dad are Christians, so I'm okay. No, you're not. If you're sitting there thinking, well, my wife is a Christian, but I, and I'm religious, but I've never been born again. Everybody must have a personal relationship with Christ. And he goes on here and he says in verse number 25, she cries out, Lord, help me. And he tests it even more. Now he's going to expose the evidence of personal faith by, by, by evidencing her position. He's really going to deal with her humility and submission. And so he makes this statement, testing and exposing this faith. Verse 26, it's not fit to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now, let's see how your Bible knowledge is. Who would be the children here? Who, when the Bible uses the word children, who's he talking about? Israel. Israel. All right. I mean, Jesus has done the, meat, the feeding of the 5,000. He's done all these things. He's, I'm the bread of life. The children that he's talking about is the nation of Israel. Now, it is true that Jesus came as the Messiah of the nation of Israel. And, and he was going to make this woman, expose that this woman that that even though she's a Gentile and she has a personal faith, it's still a faith that understands and believes that he is the Messiah of the Jews and he is the Messiah that God has sent. And so as he says, gives this illustration, it's not fit to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. He's, he's testing her submission. He's testing her her humility. He's not testing it and for her. He's exposing it to the nation of Israel because he called them stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And, 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 and they wanted the blessing of righteousness without a humility. So now I need to link a couple messages together. Oh God, I hope you stay with me. A couple Wednesday nights ago, we said that humility enables God to give what? 
For God resisteth the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. So is our God gracious? It's tremendous grace. And the way that that grace is unfolded in our lives or made enabled in our lives or given in our lives is through our humility. By the way, hell has a unifying denominator. If you die and you go to hell, you will die and go to hell and be with people who are filled with pride. Everybody in hell is filled with pride because they had no humility to the Son of God. Okay? No humbleness there. You cannot be saved without humility. Okay? So humility enables the grace of God to be given. Now help me with this verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. So if humility enables the grace of God to be given, faith is the way that that grace is appropriated in my life. No one is saved without faith. Amen? Okay. So you have a nation here in Israel. They did not want to humble themselves. They didn't want to deal with their heart. Stiff-necked and rebellious, we be of the seed of Abraham. We don't need this king. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. No humility. No true faith in him. He steps outside, and he's got a woman here who's filled with faith. Now, what he does is he gives an illustration to prove that true faith, and once it becomes personal, it understands the position. And he looks at the woman, and he says, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to the dog, to the little puppy. And I love this woman because sometimes God will, will, will test our faith with silence. Sometimes he tests it with submission and things. But here, And sometimes he'll test it with reason. And she's able to actually reason with the Lord. And she's not reasoning her, her opinion. She's not reasoning her desire. She's not reasoning her want. Look what she's reasoning back to God. Verse 27. And she said what? Truth. Truth. So if you're going to worship God, you worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So Jesus makes a statement that is true. He came to the house of Israel first to offer. He's putting her in her position. He's, ex he's, ex he's exposing what true faith is. If he did put them in their position, when he told them that you be leaders of the blind, they wanted to kill him. He says, you're a dog. In, in, the, in the mindset of, of the Jewish people, you, you, you're out without there. Now, she could have been offended, but she didn't have just an intellectual faith. She had a personal faith. She could have let that drive her from him. No, she's desperate. She's drawn to him. And what does she do? She says, truth, Lord, truth. I am a little dog that sits under the table of the master's children, but I'm also at the pleasure of the master. Because if the master takes care of the children, then the master will take care of the dog. Okay, so here's what she's saying. Yeah. You're a good master. And you take care of your children. And I might be a lowly position on the outside. But I know that the master cares about me. And I know that as you care for them, there's spillage over for me. And I don't need to be there. I'm okay where I am. I, I, I still am trusting the master. And now her faith is not in a proxy and it's not in a, in a, it's a personal, but she's understanding her position of humility and submission and nothing is going to shake her from trusting the Lord, not her own submission, not what the Savior has said, not her own position. She has still has that personal faith seated 
in the master. And, and it's displayed there, and it's, it's relentless. It's unshakable. And God said, look what the Lord said in verse number 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, read it with me now, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. So he's exposing what true faith is. And true faith understands the lowly and humble position of our lives, the outcast that we are and that we were. And yet we're not, we're not fighting about that. We're not arguing about that. We know our need, but yet still in faith, we're trusting the Savior. And by the way, we understand now from the word of God that God loves all people, amen? And God wants for all of us to be saved. And so here you have this window of illustration and he's letting the light into the nation and he's saying, that's faith. This woman has a desperate need. She reckons her desperate position and nothing else. She puts her whole trust and heart upon me. And Jesus said, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen. Great is thy faith, be it unto thee. By the way, that's what saving faith is. It's our whole heart trusted upon the Lord. Amen. Can't be saved that without that. Christian, God will test your faith. Faith that is trusted is faith that must be tested. And sometimes he'll test our faith in certain things through silence. Sometimes he'll test it through reason. Sometimes he'll test it through submission, understanding our offense, or if we're going to trust the Lord. Are we going to be anchored where faith must be anchored? Look at verse 27, and I'm done. And she said, what class? Truth. Truth. Faith that is not anchored in truth is not true faith. Okay. Well, I have faith, Pastor. You know, I go to church, and I believe I believe in God, and I'm 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 religious, and I'm this, and so I have I have faith. Yeah, you might have faith, but that faith better be deposited on the truth, and the person whose truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Can't be proxied. It has to be personal. How do I know if I have personal faith upon Christ? You understand your position. The position was I was out. I was helpless. I was hopeless. I had need. And there was no intellectualness about it. It comes all my trust is upon him. That brings the hand of God, the blessing of God, and the life of God into your life. And then, as a Christian, sometimes God will test our faith. He tests our faith that it may bring glory to him. Christian, don't get... Don't, don't, don't get offended with God. Our problem is we want what we want. We want it now. But sometimes God doesn't move in your life now because he's using you. He's using you as an illustration. He's using you to teach others. He's using you that to, to uh, enable you. Boy, if we don't hear anything from God, how could you treat me like that? All the praying I do to you and you don't speak a word to me. Or what do you mean you don't have time for me or it's not fit for me right now? How dare you talk to me like that? What do you mean I'm over here in this position? Man, we want what we want and we want it now. But God gives what kind of gifts, class? Good gifts. And he gives only good gifts. Amen? All right, let's have our prayer. We'll continue next week.